Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and the parent of a seventh grader of color in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features closed captions. To access captioning, just click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe, then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Azar, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by communities of color is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides equitable opportunities for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity in every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series seven years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar features superintendents from across Washington state on student mental health, family engagement, and going back to school. They will be joined by students from the Washington State Legislative Youth Advisory Council, also known as LIAC. As the 2021 school year begins, school districts across Washington state are focusing on student mental health and family engagement while determining what learning will look like as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our panelists today are Renton School District Superintendent, Dr. Damian Pattenout, Richland School District Superintendent, Dr. Shelley Redinger, Shoreline Public School Superintendent, Dr. Susanna Reyes, Sunnyside School District Superintendent, Kevin McKay, Touchette School District Superintendent, Robert Elizondo, and Vancouver Public School Superintendent, Dr. Jeff Snell. We also have students from LIAC. We're hoping that one more will join us in a bit, but right now we have Macy Stevens. And is that Stevens or Steffens, uh, Macy? Um, Stevens. That's what I thought, great. She's 15 years old and a rising sophomore at Hanford High School in Richland. She likes to sing in choir and participate in the school drama club. And Jeremiah Audette is 14 years old and starting his freshman year at Rogers High School in Spokane. He joined LIAC this year because he wants to be a voice for kids like him in special education. He has autism and school is hard for him, but he believes all kids deserve the opportunity to learn. Today's panel of superintendents will share what school will look like in their districts for the start of the 21-22 school year, how they would reimagine education based on what they learned from the past school year, how they plan to address student mental health and family engagement, and what kinds of support school districts in Washington need from the state as the school year gets underway. The students with LIAC will offer their feedback. If time permits at the end of the panel discussion, we'll open the floor to Q&A. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is the space for you to submit questions to us. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome, Macy, Jeremiah, Renton School Superintendent, Damien Pattenaud, Richland Superintendent Shelley Redinger, Shoreline Superintendent Susana Reyes, Sunnyside Superintendent Kevin McKay, Touchette Superintendent Robert Elizondo, and Vancouver Superintendent Jeff Snell. Let's start with the first question. What will school look like in your district for the start of the 2021-22 school year? And I'll go ahead and call on you, uh, Dr. Redinger. Sure. Well, fortunately, we had students full-time, um, except for high school, 
and middle school in the spring. So for us, we just have a few things we need to tweak and we're excited to have our students back uh, fully in person every day. That's, that's very important as you know, for our learning. We learned from last year that not having students in person really affected their learning. Um, we're excited. Uh, some things will be different as sports are back on schedule, practices are happening. We're not trying to do them all at, within a two week period at the end of the school year. Uh, we'll have drama and music performances and open houses. So we're really trying to get back to as normal as possible, but safe. And um, so we'll have a number of protocols in place to ensure the safety of our students, but we're just thrilled to have our students back. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Redinger. Uh, Superintendent McKay. Yeah, thank you and, and welcome everybody. In the Sunnyside School District, uh, we were able to to have an opportunity at the end of last school year for all of our students, K through 12, to return to full in-person learning. Uh, we do know that there were a, a number of students in our district that, that chose to continue the online uh, model of learning, or virtual learning. Uh, and so the difference for this year will be that uh, all of our students will return. We'll still have that option, but it's a much smaller number than we had uh, last spring. Uh, like Richland, uh, we, we also uh, believe uh, in establishing a, a healthy and safe environment within our schools. And so all of the, the protocols are in place, the procedures are in place, uh, some very similar to last year, the way we ended, and some new ones as well. Uh, so we, we too are looking, uh, we have been in school for now, we're in the second day, so uh, we have felt the, the return to somewhat of a normal routine, and uh, we too are looking forward to all those things that our students enjoy and our community enjoys with regards to school. Great, thank you so much, Superintendent McKay. Dr. Padnod, can I call on you? Oh, absolutely, and, and thank you again for the invite, and good afternoon to everyone, and and I appreciate the framing of the question and specifically being about the start of the year, because I think one of the lessons of the last 18 months has been the humility we need to walk with to know that we cannot predict the future or our desire for certainty when things are inherently uncertain. And in the Renton School District specifically, we had a point in time back in February 2020 where there was a period where we had the only school closed due to COVID, not only in the state of Washington and in the U.S., but in the Western Hemisphere. And so we had really been at the forefront of some of this and just the, all of the learning that's taken place and thanks to the outstanding staff and families and students that we have in our system that, that we've been able to persist in our strong community support. And this school year, I will say that there's a familiar cadence that has returned this summer. And so I think that the past 18 months felt like one long school year, but then this summer kind of the being able to allow people to take a break and to refresh and recharge and knowing that there's going to be a, a whole lot of needs that we're going to need that we'll need to meet as we begin the new school year. Um, and we're trying to meet those by also trying to return some of the aspects of school that we have not been able to enjoy in um, over the last 18 months. And so unlike some of my colleagues, we did not have all of our kids in person five days a week. So we had staggered schedules at the secondary level. We had concurrent classes running. And at the elementary level, we had students broken up into A, B, morning and afternoon groups. So the return to five days a week, everybody who wants to be in person, um, it's just an opportunity for us to best serve those students who need the in-person supports and the athletics and the clubs and all of those things that go along um, with returning to school. Additionally, we have added a K-5 remote model that looks a lot like our remote model last year for our elementary families wishing to choose that option. And for grades six through 12, we have actually just continued our alternative learning experiences program at our secondary, at one of our secondary schools. So families have also, some families have also chosen to opt in there, but very excited to get things rolling on September 1st. And, and again, just um, thankful to this community that has really rallied to support. It's not only the students who attend school in our district, but all of the students that live in our community. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Patton. I'd like to move over to Eastern Washington and Superintendent Elizondo. How, is, how does it look for the start of the school year for you? Thanks, uh, Eric, and welcome, everyone. Buenas tardes. Uh, things are looking great. Kids are really excited. The community excited. Uh, we are going to start off where kind of where we left off last year as well. Um, we do have things in place, making sure that we're mitigating strategies to stop the, the spread of this ever evolving uh, virus. Um, our staff is excited. 
we're going to continue with you know the social distancing, wellness checks, and attestations and things. Um, overall, everybody is excited to come back. Uh, we're a small school, so we don't experience some of the larger school issues. We still have those big issues, but uh, we're able to manage those a, a little bit more. So some of the things that we're still uh, working through are lunch, uh, you know, what that looks like during the lunch and outside and PE and sports. And um, uh, Shelly, you spoke about sports. The kids are out practicing and getting things back to normal as best we possibly can. So we're really excited about that. Yeah, thank you so much. And let's move to the South. Uh, Dr. Snell, how are things looking in Vancouver for the start of the, of the school year? Yeah, very similar to what's been shared so far. Our um, start date is August 31st, um, mostly around the region. All the districts are on that, that track. Um, and a lot of excitement to welcome students back. I think one thing that's um, been interesting this summer is we had a lot more students involved over the summer. So that was a real positive. Our our programming was increasing anywhere from five to 10 times the number of students that uh, took part in programming two years ago. Um, so there was an opportunity to kind of build some momentum for students and families. Um, and, you know, and, and kids last year in the spring did a great job with the, the mitigation strategies that were in place. So there, other than our, our new kindergartners coming in, I think that there's some familiarity for our students about the processes and routines that our staff worked so hard to establish with them. So we're hopeful that, you know, we can get off to a great start and, um, you know, really focus on the learning right away and the relationships right away. Um, and recognizing that the last 18 months have been really challenging for our community, our staff and our students. Um, we really want to wrap around them, uh, welcome them, really capitalize on the excitement of coming back. It's great to hear from from Kevin that, you know, they've had a successful start. We're, we're really excited to jump on that and say that we have, we've had some days and worked through some of those logistics already. Um, so um, yeah, we're ready. Great, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Snell. I'll move to Dr. Reyes, and then after that, uh, Macy and Jeremiah, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to what you've been hearing. So Dr. Reyes, how are things going in Shoreline, which is just north of Seattle? Thank you, Eric. Um, things are going really well. We are excited as well um, to join um, other districts in our area to uh, bring all students back on site full time um, every day and as back to normal as possible. We know with the more recent situation that our um, COVID environment has, has um, led us to face involves probably what feels like a couple of steps backward, right? I think at the beginning of the summer, um, late spring and into the early summer, we were feeling much more comfortable with perhaps not needing to have as many, um, uh, as much of a need for like masking in every single location. And we felt like we could look forward to really a much more normal school year. Um, and there's aspects of that that are going to be in place, such as full-time in-person schooling for students. Um, we, but as others have shared, we're going to continue with um, making sure that we've implemented all of the safety measures that are going to help keep all of our staff and students as safe as possible. Um, having our students on site every day is, will be new for Shoreline um, because Shoreline was in more of a hybrid model throughout the spring. We had opportunity to bring students on site over the summer for various summer programs. So we did um, get to practice having meals on site because we didn't have that um, over the course of last year and into the spring. So I think um, we're excited. We're as ready as we can be and um, really excited to see um, how we can support um, other families too in our community that might want another option like online learning. So we're working on, on a project in that area too. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes. Macy, Jeremiah, is there anything that stood out for you? Do you have any questions about what you heard from the superintendents? Um, well, I think uh, just hearing what you guys have said and also having experienced uh, hybrid learning and um, some of the restrictions that have been placed on uh, activities at school, like after school or extracurricular activities, I was just uh, wanted to reiterate that I'm grateful that you guys understand that um, after school activities do make up a lot of school and how it really helps build a um, nice community foundation. And I think it brings 
a lot more people together. School does, of course, but I think um, I'm glad that there is some push for extracurricular activities to come back. Um, based on what I've heard, um, my question is, um, um, kids with special education got um, a lot of help over online learning. My question is, will they be getting that much help when we go back or will they be getting less? Yeah, that's a good question, Jeremiah. I, I um, on, on our behalf here in Vancouver, I think it's really critical, Jeremiah, to, to empower our, our teams, our IEP teams, to really understand what was working for students um, in, in whatever setting they were in before, hybrid, in-person, or remote learning, and trying to replicate that the best we can. Um, the, the challenge of, of responding to the pandemic is a lot of times we were forced to use tools or learning delivery models that weren't necessarily our choice, but we, then we had to make the best of it. Uh, and moving forward, the hope is that we would be able to use those tools as our choice. Um, and so talking about what works for you as a student and then how do we align that to your instruction and your experience. And that, that could be the positive that comes out of this is that we've got way more ways to engage students and families. And so um, really listening to those IEP teams and the, and the concerns of students. And um, so grateful that you're on here, Jeremiah, and empowering student voice in that process, um, because you know best um, of what's going to work for you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Snell. Uh, other superintendents, would you like to address uh, special education? Dr. I know we, oh, go ahead, Robert. Okay, thank you. Jeremiah, thank you so much for that question. It was a wonderful question. And um, just to add to what Dr. Snell said, we're working diligently to make sure that students in special needs services and EL services and things like that continue to get the, the uh, in-person support that they need and that they deserve. And so we've been working very, very hard the last few weeks to make sure that we have things in place when you come back to school you're not gonna see a lot of, hey, you're on your own. You kind of get to you know, go through this solo. It's not gonna be anything like that. We're gonna continue that help, that support, that, you know, that diligence to make sure that you guys are feeling supported and safe. So thank you for that question. Yeah, thanks, Superintendent Elizondo. Uh, Dr. Redinger? Yes, I would, for special education in particular, we learned a lot and uh, the importance of having different modalities and touching base with students. Uh, technology, we learned a lot about technology and ways we can be more flexible with it. Um, but Jeremy, Jeremiah, my hope, and knowing Spokane like I do, you will definitely get what you got or more uh, when you go back um, in person. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Redinger. I'd like to uh, move on to the second question that uh, I have for the panel, which is, speaking of supports, what supports does your school district need now from the state as the school year gets underway? And I'd like to start with Dr. Reyes this time, just because you went last last time, and uh, this time, uh, and also you have the perspective from being on the state board. So I'm really curious to hear what you have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Probably one of the responses that um, our state is used to hearing is um, additional resources. I think um, we received quite a bit of support over the last year in terms of um, funding to support some of the um, changes that we had to put in place, like buying additional furniture, um, adding staff for different programming needs that different groups of students had. Um, and I think if, as our state um, addresses the needs, um, all through our districts that, that that continues to be top of mind for, for our state to think about ways that they can continue to provide um, additional resources in terms of funding. Um, other ways that our state can support us, I would say um, making sure that we're receiving uh, clear you know, information um, with regard to the expectations, 
um, what districts need to be aware of in terms of serving students and um, meeting requirements, whether it's for attendance or grading. Um, I think those are always on our mind. Um, I think also, as, as our state has been providing us with ongoing updates on where we are with the situation when, with regard to COVID, making sure that um, we're receiving you know, those updates, um, not only frequently, but as soon as possible so that we can make whatever pivots we need to make um, and support our families in, in whatever ways that we can. Um, I think perhaps some of our districts in our state may um, not have the kind of resources that could help them set up perhaps, for example, their own virtual learning option. And so I think as our, um, whether it's our legislators um, or other agencies at the state level that can be um, thinking about ways to support districts in that regard, I think would be really helpful. I know our ESDs are also on board with um, providing support but I think as, as we're being asked to do different things with this situation that we're in, in terms of teaching and learning, and then the options that, that our families are asking for, that um, it's really going to require us to really come together and um, as a state problem solve our way through this so that um, as many of our students and families are able to benefit from whatever ways they need that will help their students um, maintain their learning and their experiences in schools. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. I'd, I'd like to move to Eastern Washington and look at Sunnyside. Superintendent McKay, uh, what kinds of supports would your district like to see from the state this year? I don't think these are anything new, but I think they the need was exasperated during the uh, during the pandemic, and, and especially as we started to bring students back. But the staffing allocation models that are currently in place and what those allocate for needy positions within school districts like school nurses, like counselors, like social workers and those who work in, with technology, uh, those allocation models are old and, and we are in a new world and we have new needs and our students have new needs. And so um, what I would hope that the legislature would do for the benefit of our students in the state of Washington is realize that the models that are currently in place need to be changed, relooked at, and that the allocation should be more of what is currently the needs of our students. Um, during the pandemic, you know, our all stars in our, in our school district were our school nurses. And I would assume that those would be, if you're looking for all stars across the state. We were we would just happen to be lucky enough that we had invested a, a lot of local money into our school nurses where each school had a school nurse. Now, coming from a district where I was at previously, a smaller school district, they had one school nurse for the entire school district. And so I, I can only imagine the challenges that presents and what took place uh, in trying to meet the needs of students and then be up to date with all of the, the responsibilities that school nurses had. But hopefully that's shown, shown a real light of need and that there will be some changes in those models uh, to, to bring us up to date. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I'd like to move to a bigger district this time again in Southwest Washington, Vancouver. Dr. Snell, what kinds of supports would your district need because it is a larger district? Yeah, I would, I would echo uh, what my colleagues said about key staffing positions and, and ongoing support. Um, another thing is, you know, I had the unique perspective of moving districts this year. So I, I served a, a smaller school district in Southwest Washington, Camas, and um, Camas did not benefit from the federal relief funding in the same way that Vancouver has. And so I, in Vancouver, we have more opportunities to provide programming. Uh, I saw one of the Q&As was about learning loss. Um, and, uh, you know, we like to think of it that our kids, you know, there, there just may be some gaps in their learning um, as a result. And so our district is fortunate enough that we could, we increased our summer programs and, and uh, were able to maybe address some of those needs. Um, not all districts have had that opportunity. And so um, that would be something I would ask the legislature to consider is what, what does that look like across our state and, and how can we make sure that each of our, of our state students have those opportunities. Uh, I think also, you know, in a, you know we, we've had a lot of problems to, to, to work through over the last couple of years. And um, I know that everybody is interested in solving problems. Um, 
But sometimes as the legislature is, is looking at solving problems, um, you know, maybe it's pausing to, to really see what, what's actually happening in our districts and, and how that solution may or may not address um, uh, a difference for students. And so I know that sometimes as a, at a district level, like Kevin said, we, we're using local funds to, to maybe do something. Um, and, and, and what the state does may or may not help us. Um, and so it's, it's maybe just taking a pause and checking in and, and looking at one, the, the short term and the immediate impact and how can we address those, but also capitalizing on this opportunity of the transformation that's happened in public education and to, to think maybe beyond um, some of those short term things and how can we position our state very well uh, to ensure that each student um, benefits from, um, from living here and in growing uh, through our educational system. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Snell. And yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get to the re reimagining part uh, in a little bit here. I like the way you said that. I'd like to move back to Eastern Washington into a small district, uh, Touchette, and uh, Superintendent Elizondo, uh, what supports would you like to see in your district from the state? Well, uh, uh, Tushi would, would say that, uh, you know, we, we concur with uh, what the other superintendents were saying as well, continued guidance, fiscal support, um, I would also add that small schools like ours or small districts are kind of like we're perfectly the wrong size. You know, we're we're kind of too small to have a lot of help and support, but, you know, not, not big enough to have, you know, all the ESSERS dollars coming so that we can purchase the services for an additional nurse or additional counseling and things like that. So I would uh, really go out and say, that I would like for them to take a look at the, the funding model for small schools so that we could have, you know, individuals that would be able to come into our district, such as additional, uh, again, support through, through nursing or uh, counseling so that we could work with our students, our staff, and also uh, continue to help and, and educate our, our small community. We don't have that at this point in time. So, some of us wear multiple hats. And when I say multiple, I'm not saying three, I'm, I'm saying 10, you know, different hats. So yeah, from the small schools perspective, I would say, let's take a look at that funding model so that it might be a little bit more equitable for us as well and provide us that support that we need. Yeah, thank you so much, Superintendent Elizondo. And I'm sorry that I mispronounced the name of your district, uh, Tushi. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure that you hear that all the time. It's all right, I'd like to move on to Renton and Dr. Petnod. Um, what sorts of supports would you like to see from the state this year? Just as been what has been said previously, I think my colleagues have really hit on some of the, the core needs, but the, you know, and I always want to acknowledge that leading in the midst of a historic pandemic is difficult. And there's and I talked about that desire for certainty or clarity, but but just when there are opportunities for some clarity around guidance and requirements, that the sooner that we can know what the game is that we're playing, the better we can serve our, our students and families. And then the staffing pieces that have been hit on in our district of over 15,000 students, uh, the funding model drives about four staff for nursing. And so when we share that with people, people are shocked that only four nurses. And so then we're having to use our levy to supplement. But more broadly, and you've, I know you're hinting at the whole notion of reimagining, but I, I think that one of the lessons, again, of the last 18 months has been this flexibility uh, to innovate. And so how can we kind of keep that ethos moving forward about, and I understand the tension between that the legislature feels about where we're driving these dollars out and we want accountability. And so therefore, that sometimes leads to more compliance and conformity. But how do we kind of provide those opportunities for flexibility so that we can innovate and look at doing things differently moving forward? Yeah, thank you so much. And before I call on uh, Dr. Redinger, I just want to give uh, Macy and Jeremiah a heads up that once again, I'd like to give you an opportunity to reflect on what you've heard and ask any follow-up questions. So Dr. Redinger, uh, what would you like to see from the state this year in Richmond? Or Richmond? Sure. Well, I have a long list, but I'm going to give you my top three. How's that? Um, the first one, I'm really on the same page as all of my peers, but nurses. Um, if anything, this pandemic has shown us that we need to have nurses in every building and we need to have the funding to support that. Um, we, we are so in desperate need of nurses. And so I can't say that loud enough. So nurses, um, the next one is support and resources around mental health services. Last year was unbelievably hard on students and staff. 
And I think we're gonna feel the rep repercussions for that, of that for years. And so we, we need funding, we need supports, we need services, we need uh, an effort that is just all completely for the whole state. And I'm very, very concerned about that because mental health goes across those economic lines, racial lines. We just, we've got to have more support uh, for mental health. And then my third one uh, is uh, flexibility. Um, you know, I, I, I implore our state leaders to realize that how hard it is to turn a ship uh, hard and fast constantly and that you end up really uh, having a hard time. And so all the changes that they're still doing that a little bit coming out so quickly, uh, it makes it very hard for us to keep people calm and confident uh, because we say it's this one day and the next day it's something else. And, and so flexibility to make some decisions uh, based on where you're at and where your community is at. And that's it, I could go on, but that's it, three, there's my three. All right. Thank you, Dr. Redinger. Macy, Jeremiah, do you have any questions or anything that stood out for you? Um, I think I would just kind of open this up to everybody. I think uh, mental health is very important, and I think that's one of the next questions, too. But um, I was wondering, like, if we can talk, like, being specific about it, what are some of the things you guys are implementing to like really get the, this is probably the next question, sorry about that. But um, yeah, are there any like specifics you guys are trying to do, whether that means implementing more like school psychologists in every school? Like I know we have one for our district, but are they in every school or what are some specific, can't say the word, but yeah. What are some of the specifics of it? Yeah, and we can go ahead and address student mental health right now. There's no better time than the present. So yes, don't worry about uh, going into the next question. That's fine. I'm watching to see who unmutes. Otherwise, I'll call on somebody. Uh, yeah, Superintendent McKay. I'll, I'll be happy to kind of share. Uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, long before the pandemic, um, we got a call from OSPI and uh, OSPI said, hey, are you interested in uh, the Sunnyside School District joining Yakima School District and the Wall Oak School District into a, uh, a grant project um, around supporting student mental health needs? And uh, we jumped at it. It just was some of the focuses of the district at that time as we started to get into social emotional learning and all the other things uh, going along with that, understanding ACEs and so forth. Little did we know um, that we the grant would be funded, and little did we know of how important it is going to be uh, for our students and for our employees, and really for the greater communities uh, of those three school districts. So specifically, what that means is what uh, the partnership and the funds that we have available to us are uh, five years of funding that is to to build a system around supporting student mental health needs and, and in, in turn, the employees as well as the community. And what that would mean and what that probably is the most visible thing for students would be that we have uh, employed um, five uh, mental health therapists that will spend their time inside the school buildings. Uh, similar to that of a counselor or anybody else in a support staff that will, their offices, instead of having to go to a clinic someplace, maybe far away, the services will be provided for those students right in the school. And uh, that is a, a model that uh, um, the three districts are, are committing to doing, and it's nice to have the resources, but I also think it's a model uh, that is going to be vetted and evaluated and, and see if it can be replicated out uh, you know, further than just those three, but we're very fortunate. Uh, we're very excited. Uh, we have been able to hire um, in coordination with a health services company, uh, what we think are five uh, fantastic individuals that are gonna be uh, of great benefit to our students and, and their mental health needs. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent McKay. And, and I'd be curious about what's happening in Renton in terms of student mental health. Uh, Dr. Petnod, what's, what's going on there? 
No, and Macy, your question is an, is an excellent one. And you mentioned Sykes, and I know the, this is kind of getting into a little bit of the sausage making, but we just talked about um, staffing allocations and Sykes is one that is ridiculously low. I, I wanna say like at elementary, it's like one psychologist for every 180,000 students or something. We don't have a 180,000 student school district. So it's ridiculous. Um, now in our district, obviously we, we've made some investments around having a, a large number of psychs. And then prior to the pandemic, we had also hired counselors that we have at least one at every elementary school, three at each middle school and four at each comprehensive high school. Additionally, we have a partnership with University of Washington School Mental Health Assessment and Research and Training Center where they're working to do a community map of the district so that we can identify mental health resources in the broader Renton community for school-based counselors to refer their students or families to. And then more at the school level, we have um, social emotional learning cohorts at K2 and 3-5 where teachers are kind of being trained. A teacher from each grade level is being trained and then they're taking kind of these signature practices back to their buildings. And then we also have three intensive elementary sites where these are almost like learning labs for other schools to learn from. And then finally this year, one thing that we're putting in place is we're uh, working with a virtual mental health supports for our middle school and high school students called Talkspace. And so these are experienced Washington certified mental health counselors. Students have access to um, two, I think it's two 30 minute live video sessions per month and they can message with their mental health counselor that they're matched with. And age obviously makes is important in this. And so for middle school students, they need parent permission if they're obviously under the age of 13, and this is completely confidential. So it's an additional layer of support beyond what we're doing with our own staff in the district to try to better meet those mental health needs of our kiddos. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Patton. Um, yeah, I'd like to go back to uh, Tushi to see what's happening in a smaller district. How is uh, Tushi addressing student mental health? So we have a training set up next week for all our teachers prior to starting school. And so we're providing them some uh, social emotional, emotional learning techniques, things to look for, who to refer to, those kind of things. In addition, we are adding a social emotional learning component to our K-4 uh, grade levels. And we've got somebody coming in on a daily basis for an hour, uh, talking to our students and helping them through and those kind of things. Um, we also have our, our, um, our student success team that meets on a regular basis and will continue to meet on a weekly basis to talk about issues and supports for our students, our staff, and sometimes even the superintendent. So that was a joke. Okay, and uh, so we've got uh, we've also are, are in the process of putting together some support pieces like cards where uh, parents and students can use to call mental health agencies outside of regular uh, classroom or school hours. And then we're asking our, our administrators, administrators to check in with our, our staff on a regular basis throughout the day just to make sure that things are going well. Uh, we don't have a school psychologist on site. We contract with ESD at this point in time, but we do have our, uh, our counselor here. And that's why I meant earlier, we, we need more counseling and more nurses to be able to accommodate all our students' needs and the demands. So those are some of the things that we're doing. In addition, uh, as far as the communication with parents goes, I do hold uh, a coffee with the, with the, uh, with the superintendent to talk to parents and whoever wants to come in or just the greater community about some of the things that we're doing if their uh, children are having some issues at home and would like to have some added support during the school hours. Yeah, thank you so much, Superintendent Elizondo. I'd like to move just a little bit north to Richland just to find out what's happening there, Dr. Redinger, in terms of student mental health. Yes, we had... Um really a huge need at our secondary the last couple of years with some more supports. So we did establish a mental health assistant team, assistance team, we call them MHAT, and they are a team of nurses, psychologists, uh, classroom teachers, and, and they go and help in these crisis situations. And uh, that team, we, we just trained our entire staff the last three days on ways to support students with inclusion, 
as well as mental health, social emotional learning, and then self care for our staff as well. So all that fits in. We need our staff to feel very supported, and and they have self care, and that we're work, doing our job and helping provide that and options for that, so that they can meet the mental health needs and and support our students. We all know if the adults. Uh, aren't feeling strong, then it really does affect, it's hard for them to give anything for our students. And then we did start something called, it's called the BIMAS. It's an assessment, a self-assessment that students will take twice a year. Macy shake her head, she remembers it. And it basically is a check-in on if you need help or support. And so the mental health assistance team then goes and helps where we have schools that have a large number of students that, that are in crisis. Um, so we, we started that last, um, last year, last spring, for our high school students, and we will do all of our students uh, this year. So it's a good way for us to check in. Um, I also in the, saw in the chat about how the arts fit into mental health, and we actually had a parent come and talk at our uh, board meeting, well, Zoomed in, because we went to Zoom, but she uh, really highlighted the importance of the arts for her child. And that really in these tough times, the arts have helped keep her child engaged. And she was so excited that we're going to go back to performances for drama, which is very important in our community and the arts, all the arts, music. Um, and so the help, that, that is also important for our students' mental health. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Redinger. I'd like to move to Shoreline next. And to Dr. Reyes, how is Shoreline addressing student mental health? Thank you. I, I would say that um, as a district, we're also utilizing, implementing a number of strategies around social emotional learning and social emotional health. This year, as has been shared, we're also um, placing a, a really um, focused, intentional emphasis on our staff as well. I think we've all been through and it seems like we're continuing to go through this, this whole situation with COVID-19. And we've all experienced moments of, you know, possible despair or even grief over what was and how do we continue to, to you know, manage our, our, our person, our lives and, and, um, and our work life and, and for students, their school life in an environment like this. And so in order for, for us to be able to support our young people, it's really important that we also um, are taking care of ourselves. And so in Shoreline, we are placing a real special emphasis on that this year, making sure that our staff is also um, working through the feelings and the emotions and the struggles that, that we know are part of this, this experience. And so um, this week, that's, that's part of the learning, coming back together and exploring ways to to make some space for that so that people can process what they've been through and then how they can move from that um, in a compassionate understanding way about themselves to then be able to um, do the same for our students when they return to school with us on the first. Um, we wanna ensure that we continue to really expand um, ways in which we can center our students' voices um, in all of this. And so we're excited about how we might do that in Shoreline. We obviously, like many districts, have student board representatives who participate with our board throughout the year. And we have obviously our student um, um, ASB, you know, structures across our system. But there's a lot of opportunity to really find ways to ensure that we're hearing from students who, who we, we may not be hearing from on an everyday basis, students of color, students who have been, you know, typically further away from, you know, all of the supports that are available um, in our system that weren't necessarily um, as accessible to, to all of our students. And so we're really centering that this year to ensure that we're providing that. We have family what, um, positions that we title family advocates in every one of our schools so that there's that um, intentional connection with our families as well through this because Whatever our students are going through in, in our schools, we know that there's a component of that that needs to be connected with the family so that we can also be supportive of our families. And so our family advocates really play an active role in that so that it's also very focused and intentional. And going back to the funding question, we're funding our family advocates from our, um, you know, from our levy dollars. Those are, those are also positions that, that aren't funded by the state. And so 
every district is getting creative about how we can use our, our dollars to support these kinds of needs. They're critical. Um, yeah, I think those are the things that sort of came to mind as people were sharing and, and what might be unique to our experience here in Shoreline. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. And, and finally, Dr. Snell down in Vancouver. What is your district doing to address student mental health? A lot of the uh, similar things, I think it's important. I think maybe Damien said layered uh, approaches. And so uh, number one is we just need to build community um, for, for all kids and staff. And so that's that kind of initial welcoming people in and an opportunity there and new tools that we haven't had before. So um, curriculum that's focused on, on building community and helping students with, with life types of engagement skills is really important. Survey tools um, to, to check in with students and staff uh, about where they're at and what the, what the need might be. I, I saw in some of the chat, you know, just like destigmatizing, um, you know, mental health support or asking for help is really important. Um, uh, sometimes I hear from some loud voices, like stick to math, reading, writing, right? Like, why would you do these other things? Like, this is so important for us. And I think most people recognize it. And, you know, certainly I hear from businesses, like that we want students that understand how they uh, collaborate with others, understand who they are, um, people who can manage their emotions and are creative and innovative. All those skill sets are built um, when we start to come together as community and recognize the amazing gift that each of us brings to our, to our systems. And so um, there's an opportunity in all this. And there's certainly I want to, um, you know, there's some great need too. So that layered approach is really important and having mental health experts available for students, family and staff. But also fundamentally, we just need to do a great job of building community. I think um, when we look back at our experiences and what was interrupted in our community, like I'm sure grateful for an opportunity to give a, a relative a hug now by being vaccinated and those kinds of things. I don't want to take that for granted. And I think in public schools, I think we can think differently about community moving forward and really try to be as inclusive as we can. Um, some other questions in the chat were related to our students who are remote only. Um, all these strategies are the same uh, for our remote only. It might look a little differently, but uh, really forming a relationship um, through the opportunities we have. And as the school year starts and as people feel more comfortable adding in-person experiences, um, adding some extracurriculars or whatever it might be to help that student feel connected and their family to feel connected. Um, so all, all those are, are strategies that we can uh, take advantage of. Uh, somebody else put in the chat about uh, students who are nonverbal. Like what a, what a great opportunity to have a student who's nonverbal and for a class to think about how do we bring and include everybody into the community. I guarantee that student is gonna contribute so much to that class and all the students in that class will benefit from having that student as a classmate uh, because we'll creatively think about what does community mean. Um, so I'm really excited about how we come out of this and how stronger we are um, anchoring in the public school system and what it can mean for us as a state and a country moving forward. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Snell. And that sort of tees up our next question about reimagining education based on what you've learned. But before we do that, uh, Macy and Jeremiah, do you have any feedback, follow-ups before we move on? Jeremiah, I see you've, you've got something. Well, before I go on to that, I had something about the last question you asked. Yeah. Um, now, I really like how you guys are giving the opportunity for mental health but I think we all know that if we don't if we don't help the kids in special needs it's gonna get a it's gonna give them a whole lot more of the um anxiety and depression and make them feel like they're not wanted or they're not a part of the school I mean I felt that way for a very long time mm -hmm. so yeah thank you for flagging that I appreciate it Macy is there anything else you'd like to add before we move on to the reimagining question and family engagement um, no, not really. I just am grateful that everyone um, shared, I guess, getting into the nitty gritty sometimes is what's needed and need to be shared because, you know, 
outward, like showing outward, you know, there's a lot of work done between you guys as superintendents and all that, but not a lot of it sometimes gets to be shown to students or the general public. So I think it's great that you guys were able to share that. All right, thank you, Macy. All right, now the big question. How would you reimagine education based on what you've learned from the past school year? And I, we didn't quite get to the family engagement part of the earlier question, but I see family engagement perhaps being part of how you would reimagine education. Not wanting to put words in your mouth, of course, but uh, I just want to hear your takeaways from your experiences during the pandemic and what you would change. And uh, we didn't, haven't started with Dr. Patnod yet from, uh, from Renton, so um, if you wouldn't mind going first, I'll, I'll go ahead and put you on the spot. No, not a problem. And I would just go back to some things I shared earlier. One is just about <clears throat> social justice leadership. There's a, a researcher, George Theo Harris, and he talks about the notion of arrogant humility. And he says, when you're facing really great challenges, you have to be arrogant enough to believe that you can make a difference, but humble enough to know that you might not. So it's just working hard each and every day as we, whether it's reimagining or tackling some of the issues that have been mentioned in the chat, and also something I said earlier that I believe that true, a true reimagining of, of our current system will require changing rules and providing flexibility. Now, with all of that being said, one of the things we did, I think it's one thing to look to a superintendent, but you want the wisdom of the group too. And so I'm a big believer in bringing together folks to tackle tough issues. And so we had what was called our RISE Coalition, Reimagining Student Experiences. And so they really centered on and they identified these, but these uh, four core areas of practice that we wanted to reimagine. So core learning and teaching, um, social emotional learning, which we've already talked about, culturally relevant and responsive teaching. And then finally, what we didn't address necessarily in the prior question, but family and community engagement. And so they really led from a position of centering our students and what was the vision for student experience. And, on this co and in this coalition, we had students, uh, families, and then staff. And then they recommended areas of focus based on not only those the areas of practice but also organizational responsibilities so classroom teacher school leadership district leadership and what we really heard from our students and families was around this notion of internal accountability they said it's great that you're doing this but but how are you all going to hold yourself accountable and so what we've done is we've taken these recommendations and have started to develop some um, we're calling continuous improvement processes at the school level, at the district level, and then kind of telling this committee, this coalition to also hold us accountable for what we're saying we're doing. But I will say that it's not coming a complete reimagining, but the my greatest source of pride in this district, I grew up in Skyway, uh, which uh, may have changed with the most recent census data, but is the blackest section of King County. And we started what was called West Hill Now, which uh, works specifically with Skyway. And we acknowledge that as a district, we were not meeting the needs of the families in that community, but also knowing that we could be a lever for change, even if we didn't control everything like economic development. And this is an unincorporated section of King County. But it, the, the depth of the work, it, it has to go to a level where you, you have to be in it for the long haul, number one, but you have to be willing to go to a depth where you're vulnerable as system leaders and district leaders and willing to hear things that you don't necessarily want to hear. But at the end of the day, being able to form what we did, we sat at the table and formed to help to get the, the funding for a nonprofit that we don't control. And that quite frankly, a district could make the argument would be a pain in our butt because they're advocating for that community. But it's, it's that type of work that needs to take place. And that took us reimagining what our um, contractual pieces are with our education association and just doing work differently. And so now we have, it started out with three schools and now we have five schools within that zone where they're able to innovate and do things in different ways than the rest of our system. And so I think it's th that type of flexibility that we'll need to, to truly reimagine and innovate. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Patnode. Uh, Dr. Patnode, are, are you including and are involving your parents and or students in this process or is that your next step or? No, they were involved from the outset and then with the innovation zone when it was called West Hill Now, the community um, and the CBOs and nonprofits that also worked out there because you have this mentality of scarcity and everybody's fighting for dollars or grant dollars against each other. And so how can we bring folks together? And again, from a district perspective, it's in some ways it's better to have people fight with each other because then they're not able to kind of coalesce and, and truly advocate for, 
for the most underserved section of King County. And so, um, so yes, they, they've been involved and, and, and it's one of those things where not everybody agrees all the way throughout the process, but it's, but that's the type of work and the depth of work if we really wanna see the changes in the communities um, that need our support the most. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, Superintendent Elizondo, let's go to you next. And Tushi, how would you reimagine education? You know, um, I really liked what uh, Dr. Patton was, was looking at as far as the structure. And I, that's why I was asking, because I want to bring together uh, groups of individuals uh, to really kind of reimagine what it would look like and what kind of things are we doing well and what kind of things do we really need to expand on. So right now, that's kind of where I'm at at this point, Eric. We haven't really gone forward with that. Um, so I don't know exactly what that reimagined would look like for, for Tushi at this point in time. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much. Yeah. Dr. Redinger, what would you like to change in our education system based on what you've learned in Richland? Well, the calendar. I think we are stuck. I think our K-12 system is stuck because of our calendar. And we learned that. We, did, we couldn't be flexible. We, we watched what was happening with the pandemic. We shut everything down but we couldn't then start it sooner. Or, you know, we were just, we're really uh, tied to our calendars. So uh, what I would do and what I'm looking forward to doing is relooking at our calendar with our stakeholders and ways that we can serve the needs of our special education students better, uh, get away from this intense learning loss that happens over the summer, especially for our students um, that need, can't afford that time away and just really rethink everything. Uh, you know, how we do athletics and so that we can um, be much more flexible and nimble when we need to be, because I don't think pandemics are going away. Uh, for what I've seen so far, I didn't think we'd be here uh, this fall. And so we've really got to relook at our calendars. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Redinger. I'll move to Dr. Snell. Then we'll go to Dr. Reyes and uh, Superintendent McKay. Can we end with you? Would that be all right? Great. Uh, Dr. Snell. Uh, what would uh, you yeah, I love what it's already been said and, and some similar thinking around building some coalitions to, to really look at the opportunities ahead. Uh, I'm excited about time and space, like even, even without the um, changes with calendar, it looks differently. Um, I'm hoping, you know, if you think about a high school student who's been remote now for um, some time where they've been able to maybe control their schedule just a little more than they were in person, I kind of think they're going to come back to school and be excited to be back. And then they're going to be like, wait, what? Like I have to sit through 55 minutes. Like I don't need to sit through 55 minutes to do my lesson. So I think we have to be ready to capitalize on their energy around what engagement looks like. And, and I call out in particular um, secondary, just because I feel like um, there's some opportunities there to think differently about what it looks like at high school and you know, certainly if we can have opportunities for kids to be more internships, more businesses coming in, more partnerships in our community, I think that's really exciting. Um, I also love the space of our recent grads. I feel like the last couple of years, you know, we haven't really sent them out the same way we usually sent them out in, in, into the world. And, you know, that 18 to 24 year old time is, is also really important for mental health and community. So how do we wrap around them and um, bring them back into our system somehow, um, you know, allow them to mentor some of our, our, our existing students, allow them to give back to elementary schools that they grew up in, um, have them come back into our workforce so we can reflect the demographics of our community. I think that's a super exciting space for us to think about in the future. And, you know, the flexibility of some of these federal dollars is allowing us to do some things that we haven't been able to do before. Um, and so reinvesting in our community through our recent graduates, I think, is kind of a, a double or triple impact potentially on a system. So, um, you know, lots, lots to be excited about. Great. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Snell. And I'm, I'm watching the time and superintendents, if any of you need to drop off right at 1.30, I understand that uh, your schedules are busy, so feel free to do so. Uh, Dr. Reyes, what would you reimagine based on what you've learned during this past year? I would, um, I'm excited about continuing reimagining how and to what extent we can expand um, our, our student voices. We wanna ensure, and I know all of my colleagues and across the state that has been a, a topic of conversation and exploration even more so this, this past year than ever. Um, 
making sure that we're centering them and hearing from them about their experiences, much like um, Jeremiah and Macy have shared today. Um, and having them ask us those questions, including them in processes like uh, was described um, by Superintendent Patnode in, um, in Renton. And we know that to me, that's exciting because we're going to, I feel like we're going to be learning even more as leaders, really what it is that we need to do to ensure that we fulfill the promise of a, an incredible education for every single student. We're learning about how students identify as themselves as people and what is important to them. And it's up to us to ensure that we are honoring them completely as they are, who they are, welcoming them into our in communities of schools, whether it's on site or remotely, and ensuring that they have a fully inclusive, um, engaging um, experience, not only an opportunity, because we say we provide opportunities and access, but we want to ensure that they truly experience that. So to me, that's exciting. I think there's, there's ways that we can reimagine how we do that better and more effectively. And I think um, we learned a lot over the past 17 months about some of the areas that we can improve upon. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Reyes. And uh, Macy and Jeremiah, I'll give you a moment to react after uh, Superintendent McKay shares what he would like to reimagine based on what you've learned. Uh, all the things that have been said, for sure. Um, really, I'll just cut you in a couple more. And I know innovation has been talked about, but we learned, uh, at least in our school district, and I'm sure across the state and nation, we learned to do things very differently. And, and that could even go all the way through our transportation system, our meals, school meals, how we reach out to families, our, our, our entire district learned new ways to go about what have been traditionally ways that we had done for probably many, many years. Uh, the, the pandemic in the last 18 months has really, for us, identified in our strengths and our weaknesses of our entire system. And now we have an opportunity uh, as we look forward of, of how are we going to address those weaknesses and make them better and how are we going to continue to build on those strengths, but also even more so, maybe we don't need to do some of the things we've been doing for the last 20 years. Maybe it's time to just simply eliminate that. And that's exciting. It is a change again, but it is exciting to be able to even think that direction. Uh, the, this also brought about, um, I'm what I consider to be an experienced educator and an experienced superintendent, but this really brought about a whole new mindset and a whole new group of leaders started to come about within our school district. And I know around the Acma Valley of, of new leaders with new fresh ideas of how to lead systems, how to build systems, how to work with people, how to, how to really think individually about what students need and families need individually. And that to me is exciting for the new group of leaders of school districts and school buildings to be, to be the ones, uh, you know, having their voice being heard, because I think it is, this pandemic has brought about the opportunity for those to look at, for, for those who are younger to look at things differently and think about what's going to be changed here in the coming years. So I'm excited about that. Um, the importance of relationships and partnerships. Yeah, you know, we, we found out what, what are our, our uh, strong relationships and we also found out where we need to improve them. And then the partnership, the idea of not having to do it all by yourself, that there's other entities out there that support the same beliefs as you do, and, are, and in many cases are more than willing and excited to partnership in, in different, different places. So lots of exciting things. It's really kind of refreshing to have this question asked. Because over the last number of months, we really haven't had, at least in my opinion, haven't had the opportunity to really think that far ahead of what it's going to look like in the future. So, I, Eric, I appreciate that. And I hope our, our answers are, it gives people confidence that uh, superintendents are looking towards the future um, for their districts and for the state. Yeah, thank you so much, Superintendent McKay. Jeremiah, Macy, do you have any reflections on what you've heard about reimagining education? Uh, all I'm going to say is, Every student in my mind belongs. And the person who told me that is my last principal, Dr. Watson at Gary Middle School. And 
even though I wasn't there in person that much, I felt like every student had the right to learn what they wanted to and do what they wanted to. And I think that that was the right thing to do. And even without COVID, I think that's the right thing to do. Yeah, thank you, Jeremiah. And Macy, your thoughts? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Jeremiah. I think that's um, very important to um, reiterate. But I'm also, thank, thank you for having me, but also I think of what kind of what echoing what um, Dr. Superintendent McKay said, I think um, the pandemic has taught us a lot about what we need to keep and some things that we might need to take away. I think it's exciting that um, we've seen this as an opportunity that we can change things. And I just hope that there's support from um, parents and teachers and staff and from people in the community to understand that sometimes change is good, even though it's hard, change can be good and it can bring things, even though I might not see it since I only have about three years left in um, our school district, hopefully we don't move. But um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, nervous excitement about change. And I think that as long as there's support from outside the school district, I think a lot of change and good work can come. Great. Thank you so much, Macy, Jeremiah, Renton Superintendent Damian Pettinod, Richland Superintendent Shelley Redinger, Shoreline Superintendent Susanna Reyes, Sunnyside Superintendent Kevin McKay, Tushi Superintendent Robert Elizondo, and Vancouver Superintendent Jeff Snell. And thanks to all of you for submitting questions and participating in the chat. The chat log and the Q&A will be shared with each superintendent. I'm sorry that we didn't have enough time for Q&A. Superintendents, if you need to drop off because you have meetings, go right ahead as I close out the, the webinar here. Our next confirmed webinar is Thursday, September 30th, Washington State Teachers of the Year, Brooke Brown from 2021, Amy Campbell from 2020, Robert Hand from 2019, Mandy Manning from 2018, and the 2018 National Teacher of the Year, Camille Jones from 2017, Nate Bowling 2016, and Lion Terry from 2015, will share what they're hearing from students, parents and colleagues in their community will share what students need at the start of the 2021-22 school year and will answer your questions. We'll also have LIAC students from across the state to offer feedback, just like in today's panel. And we also hope to have the new 2022 State Teacher of the Year joining as well. You can register by visiting our website, educationvoters.org, and clicking on events, then, then lunchtime webinars. I'll also send registration information in the follow-up email. And on October 7th, please join us for our statewide free virtual event focused on supporting students impacted by COVID. First, we'll hear from former U.S. Education Secretary John B. King Jr., President of the Education Trust, and Dr. Vin Gupta, public health physician, professor, national health policy expert, and regular analyst for NBC, MSNBC, the New York Times, and CNN to explore the academic and mental health impacts on students during the pandemic. Then join us as we break into groups to discuss how we can support students across Washington moving forward. The registration link is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events, and I'll also share the registration information in the follow-up email. Special thanks to our community leader sponsors, Microsoft, Boeing, and Group Health Foundation. Thank you to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you'd like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, please visit our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we'll fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Macy, Jeremiah, Renton Superintendent Damian Patinod, Richland Superintendent Shelley Redinger, Shoreline Superintendent Susanna Reyes, Sunnyside Superintendent Kevin McKay, Tushi Superintendent Robert Elizondo, and Vancouver Superintendent Jeff Snell, 
Thank you again for joining us and sharing your perspectives, your wisdom, your truth, and for all you do for Washington families and students. I really appreciate your time. May you have a great rest of your week.